Welcome to the B'nai B'rith International Podcast. I'm your host, CEO Dan Mary Asham. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Hope you're staying home, wearing your masks, washing your hands, and uh, generally taking good care of yourselves. Joining me today is Dr. Nancy Sinkoff, author of the groundbreaking biography From Left to Right, Lucy Davidovich, The New York Intellectuals and the Politics of Jewish History. In her book, Professor Sinkoff examines the life of Lucy Davidovich, scholar and author of the first survey of the history of the Shoah, The War Against the Jews. From her early years in Europe to her life in New York as scholar and historian, Davidovich was influenced by her cultural roots and values, which contributed to her perspective on the Holocaust, and was one of the factors which determined her political shift from liberal to conservative during her later career. In our conversation today, I'll speak with Professor Sinkoff about her decision to write the book and what she discovered about her subject along the way to its publication. We'll also ask her about Davidovich's attitude toward feminism and how it may have affected the way her thoughts and writing are evaluated today. Professor Sinkoff is an award-winning author. She's academic director of the Bildner Center for the Study of Jewish Life and associate professor of Jewish Studies and History at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Nancy, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm thrilled to talk about the book with anyone and with you in particular. Thanks so much. Well, let's start really at the beginning. Uh, Lucy uh, was born in 1915 to Polish immigrant parents. Her story really uh, at that point is uh, like that of so many other uh, children born to immigrants uh, in the United States, in New York City, and many other places. And uh, she's in a home that's a secular Jewish home, uh, Yiddish probably spoken uh, between her parents. Um, And she uh, she takes a liking to Yiddish early on and um, has the usual high school experience, and then winds up at Hunter College, which was then a women's uh, college, often uh, referred to uh, as the the Radcliffe uh, for proletarian uh, Jews, Jewish women, a city college uh, being kind of the male uh, counterpart. Now, Let's talk about her her upbringing. Was it was there something? Let's start with her parents. Was there something that her parents imbued to her about about Jewish culture, or did she pick this up on her own? I think she grew up. I think it's very important part of her biography. Um, as you said, she was like so many other immigrant children, but the distinction was that she was educated in the Yiddish cultural world. So, and not all immigrant kids were. Um, There were four different Yiddish supplementary school systems in New York City in the interwar years, and they were ideologically um, positioned. And her parents made the commitment to send her to the Sholem Aleichem Folk Institute Shulas, that's the supplementary schools, and to their camp, Camp Boibelik. And I think that was very significant for her. Now, not all children who went to those institutions would have then gone on to love Yiddish or care about it, but she did. I mean, she chose her life. I really, you know, nothing is self-determined, right? She was given these resources, but she ran with them. So I think her parents were, were, her parents were deeply committed to Yiddish culture. You don't send your kid to a supplementary school system. It means after school, as well as on the weekend, as well as to camp, that's keyed in Yiddish, unless you care about it. So definitely that was part of what her parents uh, imbued in her. But she also then took to it like a fish in water. Her, she has a younger sister who had a very different life and cared about Yiddish, but did not become a spokesperson for Yiddish culture. So the parental home was very important, but Lucy's temperament was very important. So we're going to come back to that in a moment. But let's talk about Hunter College. Uh, again, like so many other Jews of her age, especially in New York City, her politics were on the left. And uh, she became active as a student. She was a writer and an editor. Uh, Tell us about that period. Because even though it seems that she was on the left, that that early deep dive into Yiddish culture was still very much a part of her. In other words, she didn't drop it when she picked up politics on the left. It stayed with her. Uh, And and perhaps that that made her different from some of the others. I think, again, different and not. Sorry to be so... 
you know, there were Yiddishist communists, Yiddishist leftists. So there were, there's this strange marriage between being ardently on the left, but having a commitment to Yiddish. So she wasn't exactly alone. They, you know, she joined the Young Communist League at Hunter, but was still going to the Shalom Aleichem Folk Institute. And many of her mentors, they were probably anti-communist. So it was a, a dalliance in her college years. But she remained committed to Yiddish. I have this fantastic letter when she's in the Young Communist League that she wrote to her good friend. And it was written, you know, penned on, it was on a typewriter. And it's written in black ink. And then she switched the ink to red, where she said, Zoltai Levin de Soviet Alban, you know, long live the Soviet Union. And it's written in red ink. And then she says to her friend, You see, I got the, you know, I got the 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 party line or something. So while she was in the Young Communist League, she was full, like a fulbrente Yiddishist, with you know, ideas of revolution, but she loved Yiddish. And 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 then when she leaves the YCL, the Young Communist League, she's like, enough with them. You know, and, and the Moscow trials have revealed their hypocrisy and, you know, it's bad for Jewish culture. And she remained committed to Yiddish. And she continued even after Hunter, her Hunter graduation, when she was marginally employed, she continued researching topics of Yiddish interest to her at the New York Public Library. And then, of course, she goes to Vilna in the summer of 1938 to be a research fellow with the Yuvo Institute in a program called the Asplan Tour. So Yiddish is, I, I call Yiddish is her leitmotif. It's, it's there. She moves from left to right, but she always reads and thinks from right to left. That's how I see it. It's deep, so deep in her, her commitment to Yiddish culture. You write in the book about mentors of, of hers who may have um, created the path for her to ultimately go to Vilna in 1938 uh, to be this research fellow. Tell us about the influence that those mentors had on her. And then let's talk about Vilna and that one year experience as the, the clouds of war and the clouds of the Holocaust were, were drawing in. So I think the mentorship is, um, issue is very significant. I think it's true for many young people, but I think in her case, what's very interesting is, and you alluded to it a little bit at the beginning about the issue of feminism, her mentors were primarily male. You know, so there is this sort of intellectual, young intellectual woman, and she's being guided both literally and then sort of more elusively by important men. And that starts out already in New York with the figure of Labish Lehrer, who was the educational director at Camp Hoibelik and a member of the Evo board, and Yakov Shatsky, who's a Polish historian, Polish Jewish historian. They are very important to her already in New York. And then she goes to Vilna. And she meets Max Weinreich, the director of the YIVO uh, and of the Aspiron Tour. And she meets Zelig Kalminovich and his wife, Rivala. And he's also a YIVO activist and um, a v- very significant to her. And while she's in Vilna during that year, she's writing to both Leibish Lehrer and to Yakov Shatsky in New York. So you see this kind of confluence of influences upon her. And among all those four men, you have this deep, deep commitment to Yiddish and to Yiddish civilization, Yiddish language, um, secular Yiddish culture that is shaped through a deep connection to Jewish civilization. And that's, that's who she is or was or wanted to be, I guess. And they remain the kind of signposts for her as mentors in her life and throughout her Vilna year, um, she, the Kalmanoviches are very important to her personally. Rivala and Zelig become, as she describes, kind of surrogate parents to her during that year. The uh, YIVO was the Yiddish, it is the, the Yiddish Scientific Institute. It, it, um, there's a great story, of course, of how the collections in YIVO were ultimately saved and made their way uh, to New York. And we'll leave that perhaps for another discussion, but my impression is that that, that one year uh, not only gave her an opportunity to do the research, and it had to be very exacting research because Weinreich was, a, uh, was an exacting uh, <laughs> mentor, but also she saw uh, firsthand the incidents of anti-Semitism, which perhaps also shaped her worldview as well. Maybe you can talk a little about that. I think 
there's so there's so much um, there. You know, imagine being uh, a graduate student arriving in New York. You know, before nine eleven, or not this con- this crisis, but you know, something horrible is happening or happening, but or going to happen. But you don't know that when you set out. So the drums of war are beating, but European Jews had been through a war. They were anxious, but they were living their lives. And the biggest problem for interwar Polish Jewry was poverty and the economic crisis. And that comes through in her memoir and it comes through in her memos. You know, the students who were in the Esperantur, many of them needed the stipend more than anything else. She was there as sort of these intellectual goals, but she's an American. And she says this very clearly that even in the depression years in New York, the kind of financial insecurity that she experienced was very different than what she observed in Vilna in 1938. You know, hunger or, you know, just meager food uh, sources, et cetera. So that really, you know, made an impression on her. And the war, the sense that a war might come was there too. But until the signing of the Hitler-Stalin Pact in late August 1939, it was threatening, but it wasn't uh, active. Once that happened, it was clear. It was clear. Once the Soviet Union was out of the picture, there would be a war. And that's when she left. She fled, you know, from Vilna to Warsaw to Berlin to Copenhagen. But she did also experience during that year what I would say is sort of the the quotidian or daily anti-Semitism, boycotts against Jewish stores, what she calls hooliganism, the code of attacks on Jews in the streets. And she describes this in her memoir of walking one evening after a lecture with the great Yiddish writer Chaim Gada, and he gently took her arm and kind of they moved out of the street, like into some kind of cul-de-sac or because there were students who were, you know, would beat up Jews. And he was aware of that. And she she talks about that. And I think that made a very big impression on her. Max Weinreich, her mentor, whom we've discussed, was blinded by an anti-Semitic student action. So the sense that the university is kind of cultivating anti-Jewish sentiment and that it's redounding or falling into the street culture. She's very aware of that. And um, that affects her, I think, later on in the United States, the sort of unsettled culture of the street, uh, of anti-Jewish violence. She's quite touched by that and afraid of it, frankly. Do you think that that um, experience really not only informed her, <laughs> her, her worldview, but that it, it uh, preyed very heavily on her uh, going forward in all the work that she did and all of the books that she wrote and, and, and in her worldview, right, right down to the end. That, that, that really was that and the post-war experience where she goes back after the war with the Joint Distribution Committee. She's working uh, after the war uh, in displaced person camps and DP camps. But those two experiences, let's take the two, not just in Vilna, but the before and the after, um, really um, were seared into, into her being uh, for the rest of time. And that's how she viewed Jews and the rest of the world in terms of, of those experiences. Would that be a, a correct assessment? I, I think that's exactly right. Um, I think I would also add to it, you know, you said before and the after, there's also the during, if you will. She worked at the YIVO in New York in this small organization, the, the, the Amuptel, the the, the American section of the YIVO, and Weinreich had also gotten out. And I mean, and someone once asked me this, what was it like to work at the YIVO in the 40, you know, those years from 1940 to 1945? Imagine who was there. You know, I couldn't conjure it up so well, but there's Weinreich trying desperately to make sure that his institution will have a future, to try and figure out what's going to happen once uh, the Soviets have occupied Vilna aware of the predations against YIVO um, leadership, Kalminovich, Moshe Lera, Noach Pilutsky, I mean, it could go on and on. Weinreich is writing desperately all over, trying to figure out what to do. Lucy is his secretary. as So she's aware of all that. You know, the secretaries know everything, right? They're reading all the correspondence and they're probably writing half of it as well, right? Not getting credit for any of it, but that's a different story. Meanwhile, you have refugees who've come including the historian Rafael Mahler, um, the Cherokovers, very important figures to her, as well as the man who becomes her husband later, 
Shimon Davidovich. So you've got a refugee community, people who've experienced the war, Yiddish speakers, Jewish cultural activists, and that she's aware of that. And many of them have families in Europe. So when the Warsaw Ghetto, for example, when that's uh, destroyed and, and everyone is burned alive at the end, the survivors, people at the Yivo know they are, they feel this in their, they've lost their family members. And so she knows before other people know that. And again, who knew when about the Holocaust, how we absorb the knowledge. Those are very, very big questions. But I think it is fair to say that a Yiddish speaking transnational figure like Lucy Davidovich or Liebe Schildkrat working at the YIVO is already seared by that experience. And then she goes back to work with the JDC and the JDC. And she worked in the American zone and then in the British zone. Who is she working with? She's working with refugees, survivors, people who've crawled out of cellars, crawled out of cellars. People came back from Siberia. I mean, the remnant of Israel. And how could it not affect you? It affected her forever. And plus the commitments, I think this is very important, the commitments of the Jewish philanthropic institutions of the JDC, despite all the complaining that she made about them, the incompetence of this one, that that one, that comes, that's par for the course, right? But she's meeting this cadre of committed Jews from South Africa, from England, from the United States, who are doing what they can for the refugees, as well as for the property that's been plundered. And I think that had a very big impact on her in terms of her political views, to see that there could be this charitable organization, some of whom work behind the scenes, work with governments who are trying to help the Jews. That's very different than a leftist perception of rev we need revolution to overturn the world, to overturn the systems, to make sure to guarantee a Jewish future. So I argue that that, too, is part of her political arc from left to right, a kind of rapprochement, if you will, with mainstream politics. Um, and I think that then the years at the American Jewish Committee, she worked there for almost 20 years, sort of um, made that even stronger. The idea that, you know, men in power actually can get things done as opposed to distrusting them. Well, let's, let's segue now, because now we're, at, we're post-war, um, to the New York intellectuals, the, the name given to that group of people that included Irving Kristol and um, Norman Podhoritz and Seymour Martin Lipset and so many others. The list is a, is a long one. And uh, she, was, she was part of, of that circle. Where, where is everybody now after the war? Uh, as we move into the 50s and then into the 60s, Lucy is, is um, she's on her own odyssey uh, and her own migration. Uh, tell us a bit about, about that group and uh, her place in it and uh, where um, she agreed and may have differed uh, with some of these folks. So thank you for that question, because part of the subtitle of the book, and not everyone picks up on it, you know, Lucy Davidovich, The New York Intellectuals and the Politics of Jewish History, it was very important uh, for me. It's the way I think about her. I, I imagine her as kind of like a, um, someone with a headlamp in the dark, and when it's very light outside, you don't see the headlamp. But when it gets dark, you see it. So she's part of the New York intellectuals later, not earlier. In, the early, in their early years, what I call their cosmopolitan heyday, it's the boys, if you will, of City College, right? These smart Jewish intellectual kids who are going to change the world. They're integrating into American society. They're going to be become fully American because they feel like outsiders. They're alienated. They're going to take on the world, right? And you, they were all, they were all like that, right? They, they, Crystal and Podhoritz and Howe and Trilling and Hook and later Daniel Bell and Podhoritz. You know, they they were armed with language and they were going to change everything. And their first encounter was cosmopolitan, universalist, um, left-wing. Most of them were anti-communist Trotskyites. They were anti-Stalinist. In those years, Lucy is a, is a Yiddishist. You know, she's in the Young Communist League, but she's also devoted to Yiddish, as we've discussed. But different from the men, from boys who become men, she's not inducted into the American army. She doesn't encounter America that way. She's inducted into the cause of Yiddish and then through the JDC. And so in the post-war years, 
she has an experience that none of them has. She has been involved with the Jewish communal leadership. She knows all the people that, you know, some of Leo Schwartz and Koppel Pinson and the men of the uh, JDC with whom she corresponds. She has become part of this international Jewish welfare charitable world. And she has experienced the destruction of her beloved culture. The people she knows have perished, have been murdered in the most heartless ways. I mean, when she hears that Zelika Manovich and Rivala have been murdered, she she just falls apart. You know, they they were so important to her. So when the New York intellectuals who turn towards Jewish culture sort of begin to respond, if you will, to the Horbin or to the Holocaust, I'm thinking here Irving Howe and Elie Greenberg beginning to translate Yiddish culture literally into the anthologies of uh, American for American audience. And other people are beginning to talk about the effect of the destruction of European civilization on American Jews. There she is, there she is you know, with her headlamp. And they understand that she knows something, she has experienced something that they haven't. And so to the men who turn rightward, she, she anticipates them in many ways not from politics, but from Jewish culture. And that's what speaks to her. And when they begin to be more engaged with Jewish particularism, if you will, when they begin to articulate the need for that, she's there for them. And Nate Perlmutter, who worked for the ADL, whom you you worked with, he was extremely important to her. And Milton Himmelfarb at the um, committee, very important to her. Norman Podharitz is educated Jewishly, very important to her. So that's, that's how I see it, that she's a New York intellectual sort of late, but she anticipates their turn. They don't really know where they're going, but when they get there, she's already there. I don't want to um, leave out uh, before, before we close uh, her important and groundbreaking work in Holocaust history, the war against the Jews. 1933 to 1945. Tell us, tell us about that and its lasting impact on uh, the historiography uh, of, of the Holocaust. So I think it's important to remember that in 1970, say the years 1971, 72, what books are available for a literate English reading public? that narrate the events. There are, there are some books, I don't want to discount them, but most of the most prominent ones are written from the per, what is known as perpetrator history, from the perspective of the Nazi machine. The most important, of course, is Raoul Hilberg's really groundbreaking book, The Destruction of European Jewry. There are some other works out there, but mostly on the Third Reich or on Hitler. Lucy's book, The War Against the Jews, was significant in its day because it represented Jewish voices. She was committed to having Jewish sources speak to the events. So the book is written in two parts. And the first is the what happens, the legal, economic, racial uh, assault upon the Jews. And the second part of the book is the Jewish response. And that was very innovative at the time because she let the victims speak and their efforts speak before many other people. And the whole book, the whole second part of the book, she, ta- she uses the word Jewish community. And I argue that she is part of a long line of Jewish historical writing dating to Shimon Dubnov, who was the great Russian Jewish historian who believed that Jewish communal life in the diaspora was in fact the life-saving or life-affirming aspect of Jewish existence, right? Communal, communal institutions is what allowed Jews to exist in the diaspora. And I would argue that that's how she shaped the second part of the book. The book is also a synthetic work. She doesn't do so much of her own primary research, except on the second part, but she pulls together the assault and the response. And the title is very significant, The War Against the Jews. 1933 to 1945. In that title, she tells us so much. She tells us, first of all, that she believes that the the final solution was intentional, right? And she's known as an intentionalist, that Hitler planned, had an eye, had an idea already when he becomes chancellor to destroy the Jewish community. That's a controversial position, but she was very clear. She looks back at his rhetoric. She looks back at what he wrote in Mein Kampf. She looks back at the prophecy of 1939. 
she takes seriously when he uses language annihilating the Jews. She takes that seriously. Other people argue that functionally, the development of the final solution is later, uh, the Vance Conference in 42. Uh, these are issues that we can't really explore in the limited amount of time. But I think the title is very important. And the war against the Jews also tells you that she believed that at the same time that the Germans were prosecuting a conventional war for land, imperialism, resources to get rid of the Soviets, that they were prosecuting a war against the Jews that was distinct and separate. And that was unprecedented, an attack on a civilian population to extirpate them. So that perspective is articulated in that book. It was greeted with enormous fanfare and with enormous uh, accolades at the time in 75. But it quickly or not so quickly gets overshadowed by academic and other perspectives, functionalist approaches, the idea that there were structures in European society that led to the destruction of the Jews, that the intention wasn't encoded already, that Hitler's henchmen didn't necessarily know what he meant. And there's pushback. There's pushback against her perspective, and she kind of falls out, I would say, of the tradition of writing about the Holocaust. The other thing that's very important to understand is that everything changes in terms of history with the fall of the Soviet Union, and already already a little bit earlier in Poland, where all of a sudden new resources and new sources are available. Israeli scholars can go back to Eastern Europe. There's a sharing of documents. And we know so much more, and a whole industry, if you will, of Holocaust studies grows from the late 80s until today where, you know, we know the details of life in the Woods ghetto. We know what it was like to survive in a cellar because of a Gentile in the, you know, in, in Lviv. We couldn't, we didn't have access to that in the same way in the 70s. The material we had were survivor testimonies and there was a certain skepticism about them. So she helped create the field and then was, was sort of left left behind. And I argue, though, that her, because history comes around, interpretations come around, that some of her seminal points are still being debated today. Um, and I'll just say quickly, you know, the issue of interwar Polish anti-Semitism, cooperation and collaboration of local populations, the degree to which Lutheranism and um, religious anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism actually informed the modernization of the German state. Uh, the uniqueness or unprecedentedness of the Holocaust, uh, Hitler's intentionality, the significance of language. These issues are still being debated today. The best works today are revisiting those questions. I'm thinking of Saul Friedlander. I'm thinking of works on Lutheranism, Michael Morrison. I'm thinking of uh, Alon Confino's work, uh, all the work on Poland, all the very contested work on Poland and quote-unquote collaboration. She, I say she anticipated a lot of these major issues. So the book itself, if not state-of-the-art today historiography, is nonetheless, I think, set the agenda for many of the issues that we still think about. One more question. She, um, Lucy was um, a woman in a, in a world of, of men intellectuals, New York intellectuals. She, she wasn't, uh, though, a feminist in the... Uh, connotation or the description that we would give that word today. So say a bit about that. Some of it's temperamental and some of it's generational. She grew up at a time where she believed um, that there were certain universal standards and that merit, hard work, and achievement would get you into the inner circle. And that's what she strove for. That's how she was educated at Hunter College, which was, you know, the Radcliffe of uh, the city system, like City College was the Harvard. She was extremely well educated. And she was interested in politics and the worlds of ideas. And I can say that that was sort of gendered male in those years. So in order to participate in those discussions, you had to act like a boy. You had to be armed with the same kind of intellectual rigor, robustness, rhetorical fisticuffs that they were, if you were going to be heard. And she was heard and they listened to her. So when feminism emerges in par as part of the social movements of the late sixties, which sees uh, women's status as a kind of grievance or, you know, that there's a, something called the patriarchy and women's group rights need to be recognized. 
she didn't take it very seriously. She thought it wasn't very procreative in terms of having cultural, a cultural significance. She reacted to it the way many people in the old left reacted to the new left. She thought there was a lot of whining, kind of a lot of whining going on and that women's, you know, women could be equal if they played on the same terms as men. She also, her critique of feminism also had also had to do with the push for the feminization of Jewish ritual. I think that's important. The Jewish feminists who cared about Jewish life were frustrated with participation in public prayer, to being ordained as rabbis and cantors, to being taken seriously on Jewish federation boards, to having a vote at their synagogue board meetings. She, on some level, you would think she would have been sympathetic to that, but she was so litvak in her temperament that she was attracted to sort of traditional Jewish culture where not so much women knew their place, but they didn't have to take on those public roles, that those were male roles. And she, Lucy, in her rapprochement with religion, her select, very selective rapprochement, was attracted to traditional Jewish ritual and culture and didn't feel the need to insist on women's participation. And in that regard, she was uh, behind the times, if you will, and not in sync with some of her younger friends. And the last thing I'll say is she also put, she lumped feminism in with environmentalism, new left culture, counterculture, um, anti-Israel sentiment. I mean, she tended to lump those movements together and therefore was suspicious of them as disrupting the civil fabric of American society. Well, I want to close. I want to read something from your epilogue. It's actually near the end of the epilogue. You say, even as Davidovich moved toward an embrace of Jewish religious practice and politically from left to right, it was the East European Jewish culture written from right to left in her beloved Yiddish Aleph base that formed the deepest wellspring of her Jewish identity. Yet Yiddishkeit, her anchor, fit uneasily into the post-ethnic multicultural landscape of late 20th century America. Now, I know you've said in a, in a previous interview, you said, you, you said you're a historian, not a prognosticator. Mm. So I'll, I'll ask it in a different way. <laughs> I'm really looking for the answer because you know so much about her. If, if Lucy were, were here today, uh, now 30 years have passed since her passing, and a lot of things have happened over these 30 years, uh, in terms of, of the divisions that we see today in our own community, but of course, in the macro sense, Every, every, almost every place else. What do you think, in a nutshell, she might have to say about what's swirling around us today? Well, I am not a prognosticator. You know, people always say I'm not a prophet, but I that I use the fancy word prognosticator because prophets received the word of God. They weren't. Uh, they didn't tell the. Tr- they didn't uh, bespeak the future. That's what prognosticators do. So I'm neither a prophet or a prognosticator. I am. Um, you know, Lucy died in 1990. So. Um, fortunately for me, I didn't have to grapple with, for example, the Bush doctrine or the war in Iraq, these, the, the ways in which neoconservatism morphed into a more mainstream conservatism and support of those years. And then what the situation we're in now, which are, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't really characterize them as conservative at all, but we have great polarization. We great polarization in the American society in Israeli society, the society she cared about, and in Jew- and Jewish American society. So that that's unquestioned. Um, where would she sit? I don't know exactly. I think she might have, she would probably be bewildered because her, her, her gut, which had moved to the right, um, would probably, I would think, be uncomfortable by the lack of, the lack of attention to expertise today, the lack of attention to sort of canonicity of values, I think that would be disturbing to her. But I, it's hard for me to say. We've seen in this recent, in the last couple of years, several prominent sons of the neocons move back to the center, if you will, or express displeasure with the Republican Party but I don't think they're probably that happy with the Democratic Party either. I think that the question is what what kind of centrist, where do centrist Americans belong today with such a polarized political field? And I think that's what I said. She anticipated some of these problems. I'm not sure 
really what the answer is or how she would have answered. Well, Nancy, thank you so much uh, for joining us and especially for, for writing this book and bringing to life the life uh, of an extraordinary woman, uh, an extraordinary Jew, uh, who um, contributed so much to, um, to Jewish life and Jewish culture. And really, um, we appreciate your doing that work to enshrine uh, the important work that uh, she did. Thank you. Well, if you've uh, liked what you've heard, make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button where you get your podcasts. And be sure to visit our website, benebrith.org, to learn about our work. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. The book is From Left to Right, Lucy Davidovich, The New York Intellectuals and the Politics of Jewish History by Nancy Sinkoff. For my guest, I'm your host, Dan Mary Ashen. We'll talk to you next time on the Benebrith International Podcast.